I was thinking about, especially um, this message over the last couple of weeks, um, following Jesus' life. And so um, what I want to do is just say, um, in the next few weeks, we're going to grow up with Jesus. And what I'd like to do today is focus on his, his first 12 years. And um, I want you to think back. For most of you, I don't see any 12-year-olds here. Um, Lucius is 14? 13. He's going to be 14. Um, so, um, but in that, that first part of your life, there was so much coming together. Um, you were learning to read and, and, and write. You were learning to walk and, and run. And, and you were learning how to relate with people. And, and there was so much going on. You were, you were trying to figure out how this body works. And maybe you were testing it to see how fast does this thing move? I want to see how fast it, like buying a new car, right? You want to see? How, no, don't do that. Um, so that's what you were doing. That's what I was doing. Those first 12 years, uh, just testing this, this body that God gave you. And so you were just working things out. And um, is it amazing to you, and maybe it's just me, but about 12 years old, the lights start coming on with different things. Oh, that's why. Oh, now I see. Do you remember that? And maybe some of you was earlier, but, but for me, that was about 12. There was like, no kidding. That's what that's all about. Wow. So um, we're going to look at, at Jesus' life, but also reflecting on your own life. And, uh, and so this first part of Jesus' life, a glimpse into Jesus' life is... Um, is called a, called a close call. And maybe you've had a close call in your life as, as a young person. Um, when Rachel, our youngest, was born, uh, a close call with her, immediately after she was born, there was something wrong with the blood thing and the placenta and all that. And we, were, uh, we put her on the helicopter and uh, she was taken to Children's Hospital. And so Natalie and I drove down that time. I had my 68 Mustang, and we made quick work getting to Seattle. <laughs> um, but we get there, and, and so that close call with that, she had to have blood transfusions, and, and it was like, wow, close call. So maybe in your life, maybe you can't remember. Certainly Rachel couldn't remember, but maybe your parents have said, yeah, you slipped and fell. And, uh, so a close call. So uh, what we're going to do is look at um, chapter 2 of Matthew, and then we're going to go to chapter 2 of Luke. And so we're looking at this close call with Jesus. Um, so this close call with Jesus um, happens when the wise men show up. Do you remember that? The wise men show up, and they're looking for the king of the Jews. And so they go to Herod in Jerusalem, and they ask about the king of the Jews, and uh, Herod, um, he comes up with a plan uh, to deceive them because he's the king. And so you remember how it goes is that the wise men, um, they tell Herod, and Herod says, oh, so when did this star appear? And um, when you go and find this new king, uh, come back and, and tell me, and, and we too will worship the king. So he was planning to kill the Christ child. Close call. So here's what happens. So go to um, Matthew chapter 2, and let's look at verse 16. So when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the magi, or the wise men, he, made, uh, he became very enraged and sent, and he killed all the male children who were in Bethlehem in all the surrounding areas from two-year-old and under according to the time which he had heard from the wise men, verse 17. Then, which was spoken through the, Jeremiah the prophet, was fulfilled, saying, a voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be comforted because they were no more. So a close call for Jesus, and yet a whole bunch of baby boys were killed. Close call. And so Mary and Joseph would 
return to Nazareth after Herod dies. And so, you know, they had, they had run away to Egypt. An uh, uh, angel had warned Joseph in a dream, take your child and, and the mother and run away to Egypt. Um, for Herod's going to kill the baby. And so, close call. So maybe a close call in your life, um, physically, a close call, and God saved you. God saved you, saved Rachel, uh, and now Rachel's in Sri Lanka. Uh, she's at a close call over <laughs> there. For, she's in Sri Lanka serving the Lord. And what's amazing is that God had a different plan for Rachel, that she wouldn't die as a baby, but that God had a plan for her to become a missionary, and now she's in Sri Lanka. And uh, so just thinking right now about your life, if you had a close call, um, God said, nope that his saving grace came upon you and he said, I have another day for you to live. I have something for you to do yet for my kingdom. And so maybe you're here today. Maybe, maybe it wasn't when you were a toddler, but maybe it happened last year and you're going, I'm here to say that I'm, I'm living another day that, that Jesus saved me. So thinking about that physically, but how about spiritually? There was a day when God caused you to become born again. If you've believed on the Lord Jesus, he's caused you to become born again. Since that time, he says, I've got another job for you other than living a physical life and growing up and getting married, all that stuff. In the midst of that, I want you to serve me. I want you to love me. And so since that time, uh, you've been... uh, following the Lord, there's been a a new direction in your life. You've been saved. What does it say um, in in John, John chapter 1, verse 12? It says, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. And then listen to this, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. That, that is God's doing. So you've been given a new life, a, a new time to live. And so you're here today living that life. You've been saved to live a new life for him. So that first glimpse into Jesus' life and maybe in your life as you're reflecting, that first glimpse is that you've been saved. You've been saved to live another day. So go to Luke chapter 2 now. So from Matthew chapter 2 to Luke chapter 2. And it's kind of cool how the gospels come and they share about Jesus' life. Some of, some of Matthew wasn't shared in Luke, but now we're picking up at Luke in, in the gospel of Luke and so here, Mary and Joseph, uh, they've presented Jesus um, and, um, in Jerusalem. And, uh, and so they're headed back to Nazareth. So I'd like you to look at verse 39 and 40. And um, this is a glimpse of, of Jesus growing up and, and what life was kind of like for him. Just a glimpse of it. Um, and I call this God's saving instruction right here. Look at 39 and 40. And and I think we'll do 41, yeah. So 39, and they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord and uh, returned to Galilee to their own city of Nazareth. And the child began... uh, continued to grow and become strong, increasing in wisdom and grace, and the grace of God was upon him. Verse 41. And his parents used to go to Jerusalem every year to the feast of the Passover. Okay. So here's that glimpse into Jesus' life. So it says in 41 that his parents um, were giving that instruction to the Christ child, giving that instruction, and every year they had determined to go from Nazareth uh, to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. Is that, is that impressive? That's about 60 miles, so you're walking 60 miles. How far is that? How long would that take you to walk? I think it's about 30 miles to Mount Vernon. That'd take me a week to walk, I think. Um, so they purposed, and what a celebration that was to go. And of course, that was, um, if at all possible, in, for the Jews to go to Jerusalem once a year, Uh, was a big deal, and so they would go. So talk about celebration, talk about time, but thinking about they were bringing Jesus, 
as they celebrated the Passover, they would celebrate the Passover lamb. And isn't it interesting that they would bring the Passover lamb? <laughs> For 12 years, Jesus, the, the lamb, as, as John the Baptist said, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Here is Jesus growing up. I wonder how much he knew in those growing years who he really was. How much did he know? But they're taking him to the Passover, so he's growing up in the Passover. Um, so here's a fact that you probably know that um, Jesus wasn't the only child in that family. In Matthew chapter, um, let me see here. In Matthew chapter uh, 12, 46 and 50, and also in Mark 6, 3, it records Jesus' brother's and sisters. It says in Matthew chapter 12, verse 46 and through 50, that uh, there was um, his brother James, Joseph, Simon, Judas, and the sisters. So just thinking, just a glimpse into Mary and Joseph's life, Jesus' life, when they were taking Jesus to Jerusalem those 12 years so far to celebrate the Passover, there, was other, there had to be other kids around too. So they're, they're bringing, they're going with the family to celebrate the Passover. So just kind of getting a picture, a glimpse of Jesus' life, growing up Jesus' life. I wonder if Mary and Joseph ever said to, to the rest of the kids, why don't you be like your older brother, Jesus? Why don't you do that? He's, he's, he's a good example for you to fall. So a glimpse into Jesus' life. So backing up just a verse, I wanna, I wanna look at two words. So in uh, 30, or verse 40, it said, the child grew and became strong. So that's his body's grown up. And it says, increasing in wisdom and the grace of God was upon him. So here's Jesus, fully man and fully uh, God, growing up. What was that like for him to grow up? But it says that he was increasing in wisdom and the grace of God was upon him. So let's look at those two words, uh, wisdom. So wisdom is not knowledge. Okay, so uh, wisdom is applying what you know. Okay, so you, you attain knowledge. And so the wisdom is, how do I use this knowledge? How do I how do, I do this? Um, so the Greek word is Sophia. Um, so true wisdom from God, though, is how do I deal with God, my creator, and then how do I deal with the people around me? That, that's true wisdom from God. Is, this is what really matters. Okay, so let's talk about uh, wisdom, uh, the world's wisdom, and then God's wisdom for a moment here. Now, um, in 1 Corinthians uh, verse, uh, chapter 8, verse 1, um, Paul talks about a, a warning about attaining knowledge. Knowledge is good, but it's what you do with it. And so he says, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Just think about that for a minute. Now, can you, can you have both of those? Well, yeah, you have to have knowledge, but there's something way more important going on. He says, uh, love builds up. Okay, so that kind of gives kind of a world's wisdom and, and God's wisdom. He's way more, way more, uh, there's way more importance that God is saying on the love factor than the knowledge. So here's Paul writing about uh, true wisdom and, and what to do with knowledge. Now, there's some of you even in this room that are brilliant. And I would, not to offend you, but I would call you a walking encyclopedia or a walking dictionary. And it's cool to have people that are smart. And, and it's cool to have w walking dictionaries and encyclopedias in your house. And you can say, how do you spell dog? Or no. <laughs> how do you spell encyclopedia? And it's like, oh, this is a, that's a cool thing. I've got one in my house. And she's a walking dictionary encyclopedia. It works really nice. 
And so, um, so that's, a, that's a cool thing to have people, I don't know what happened to me, maybe I didn't pay attention in school, but I think my processor works just a little bit slower. And so I've learned that through the years and maybe you've figured out your body and your, your brain too going, okay, this guy works a little bit slower than it looks like most people work. So how are we gonna work with this guy? So, um, Knowledge. So we're talking about what do you do with the knowledge that you have? So um, right now, it is the weirdest thing, but you don't have to have your own wa uh, walking encyclopedia in your house. You've got Surrey or you've got Google and you can go, well, I can find out right here. And so right now around the world, we, we have this huge um, uh, ability to attain knowledge. And what happens with that is kind of weird. It's like when you go online, I've talked to different people, and I said, how do you know even when you go online what's true or not? Well, I, I'm smart enough to know what's, what's, you know what's up or not. But, you know, there's a lot of information out there. So um, what's interesting is that there are times when knowledge goes south. And... Um, the building up of knowledge becomes prideful. And, and so attaining that knowledge, uh, a person can get, I know it, and I'll tell you exactly what's going on. Or when you start talking with them, they just start downloading all this information and you're just like you're in a, a fire hose. You're taking, <laughs> I, I can't keep up with you. Um, so there's this temptation that pride gets in that when you attain more knowledge, you can tell people where to go and what to do, you know, that kind of thing. And so that's why Paul, he talks about knowledge puffs up. It can do that, but love builds up. But what a beautiful thing to, to have both and say, you know what, I'm going to use my knowledge to honor God. There was this movie years ago where this young man says, uh, coconuts, don't you know where coconuts come from, brainless? You know, I, I am a member of the National Geographic Society, and I'm an adventurer. And so he's, he's just saying, look, I know where coconuts come from. So here's, I want to look at Paul's life, because here's a man that had been schooled with the best. He was born in the right bloodline, and, but this man is saying, I want to know nothing more than Christ and him crucified. So something changed in this man. So let's look at this. Um, go to, I don't think I have it in your notes, but go to Acts chapter 22. In Acts chapter 22, uh, it talks about, Paul is given his story about what happened to him and who he is. Um, in chapter 23, it talks about uh, him being a Pharisee, but let's look at this. Um, so in chapter 22, Verse 3, he says, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated under Gamaliel, strictly according to the law of our fathers, being zealous for God just as you are all today. I was persecuting the way to the death, binding and putting both men and women into prison, and as also the high priests and all the council of the elders can attest, from them I also received letters to the brethren and started off for Damascus in order to bring even those who were there to Jerusalem as prisoners to be punished. And it came about that when I was on my way approaching Damascus about noontime, a very bright light suddenly flashed from heaven all around me, and I fell to the ground. And I heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus, the Nazarene, whom you are persecuting. And those who were with me beheld the light to be sure, but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. 
And I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, arise and go to Damascus, and there you will be told all that has been appointed for you to do. A life change for Saul. So his Hebrew name was Saul. His Roman name was Paul. And it goes on, he goes on to say, but since I could not see because of the brightness of the light, I was led by the hand by those who were with me into Damascus and a certain man named Ananias, a man who was devout by standard of the law and well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, came to me, standing near me, said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very time, I looked up at him. And he said, the God of our fathers has appointed you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear an utterance from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to all men of what you have seen and heard. So here's here's Saul, that he had a life-changing, altering situation that caused him to say, so now go to uh, 1 Corinthians. Go to 1 Corinthians. When he talks about wisdom, this man that had it all, that was a growing Pharisee, in verse 18, he says this, for the word of the cross to those who are perishing is foolishness. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of clever I will set aside. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since the wisdom of God and the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to the saved who those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for a sign, Greeks search for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block, and to the Gentiles, foolishness. But to those who are called both Jews and Greek, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brethren, that you are not many wise, but according to the flesh, not many mighty, but and not many noble. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. And the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen the things that are not that he might nullify the things that are. But no man should boast before God. But doing But by his doing, you are in Christ who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. And just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. And then listen to this. I'm not quite finished yet. And when I came to you, brethren, I didn't come to you in superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God, for I determined to know nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified, and I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling, and my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and the power that your faith should not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. So world's wisdom, God's wisdom, world's wisdom is puffs up, but God's wisdom or God's knowledge builds up, love builds up. So the Bible says that Jesus was growing in wisdom. Okay, so we know there's a difference that God's wisdom is is love. There's a difference. So applying this kind of wisdom. So let's get to the point and say, what is wisdom then? Turn to James chapter three. So go to the back of your Bible. Easiest way to get there is go to Revelation and thumb your way back in and you'll find yourself coming upon James. So here, uh, James makes it real clear what this wisdom is 
um, the difference it is. So James chapter 3, verse 13. Who among you is wise and understanding? Watch this. Let him show by his good behavior and his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. And then he does this contrast, so we're not out of the woods with the difference between worldly wisdom and godly wisdom. Verse 14, but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and lie against the truth. This wisdom is not which comes down from above. It is earthly, natural, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder in every evil thing. Okay, 17 and 18 is where we come up out of the water. We get a breath of fresh air. But wisdom, here it is, wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, then gentle, then reasonable, full of mercy and good deeds, unwavering without hypocrisy. And he's not done yet. Verse 18. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So this wisdom that Jesus was growing up in as this human boy, but he's God the Son. He's growing up and, and understanding however that works, how soon did he know all this? How soon did it, coming together for him is this wisdom from above, this wisdom of who God is and who he is, this wisdom. So who among you is wise? And that's the beauty of watching God's Holy Spirit. When you see a humble person walking around, when you see one that is serving, when you see one that is peace-loving, when you see one that is nurturing, you go, there's wisdom. That's God's wisdom. That's, that's where it's at. That's how to apply the knowledge that you and I have been given. How do we, how do, we do that with what we've been given? How do we apply that? Well, here's true wisdom the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So how do we apply that? So I, I'm not going to go to it right now, but Proverbs 8, verses 11 through 17, is, is yet another cool place that talks about wisdom. But the second word is, um, is uh, grace, charis in Greek, grace and unmerited favor. So the Bible says, uh, back in, in uh, Luke chapter uh, 2, it says of Jesus that the child became strong, strong, increasing in wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. So, so grace, grace. So I was looking at different things, trying to get a hold of this grace, and, and favor is one of the words that comes. But, but listen to this. I thought this was just the coolest thing. It just touched my heart, and maybe it'll touch yours too. Um, this grace that comes from God is absolute freedom in knowing that you are loved by God. Freedom to know that you are loved by God, knowing God's love for you and your f forgiveness that God offers, that's the most amazing kind of love anybody could ever do for you is when your spouse forgives you or when your, your brother your, forgives you, but thinking that God forgives your sin and that he loves you. Um, there's something that happens to a person when they know they're just so totally loved. And what happens to that person is they start giving out love. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing to watch. But I've come to, to see that in my life and I'm, I'm trying to grab hold of that more and more because maybe you're kind of like me where I've always struggled with, am I really loved by God? Did my parents really love me or was I adopted some, you know, just, you know, that kind of, 
wrong thinking. But when, when someone really understands that God loves them, they're free. You're free because it's like, well, who cares now what happens? I'm totally loved. So there's some people even in this room that I've, I've witnessed that they, they've, they've grabbed hold of this, this, this love, this pure love, and they've pulled it into themselves. And when you talk to them, they're just giving it out. And it's the coolest thing to see. And one of the people that is suffering right now in the hospital that we're praying for is Garrett. If you're around him, he just, he just ekes out this, his stories about how he's prayed with somebody and they've, they've turned and how it's just the coolest thing to be around somebody. And if you know Garrett's testimony, it was not, it's not a pleasant life that he's come out of. But somehow, somehow Garrett was able to grab hold of God's pure love for him and the forgiveness of what he's done in his life and he's brought it into his heart, and then it starts coming out. It's the coolest thing. I look around this room, and I see others that they understand that, and it's just so fun to be around you when, when I hear you talk, and it's like this, this wisdom starts coming out because that is true wisdom, isn't it? It is God. Different than the world. So it's taking the knowledge that you've attained in this world and channel it through God's love for you and for others. But it changes things. God's love changes things. And so here the Bible's saying that Jesus in this weird, maybe his body was growing up faster than him. You know, you hear maybe you got growing pains. That's why you're, you know, you talk to young kids and they're just... Or you see some of these kids, they're growing so fast that their, their feet are bigger than, you know, and the mom and dad have to keep buying new shoes. And man, that puppy's going to be tall. Look at the shoes. <laughs> you know, and, and he's kind of tripping or she's tripping and she's growing into who they are. You know what I'm talking about. At about 12, the lights start coming on. You're going, oh, this is, this is interesting. What do I do with this? And if you've come to believe in the Lord Jesus, all of a sudden there's a new awakening going, oh, this is what I'm supposed to do with what I have. So the third glimpse that we get of Jesus' life is when he's 12. And it looks like the lights are coming on. So Jesus does something different here. He's coming into his own. And um, many of you, you know, you're teaching your son or your daughter how to hammer or whatever. And then all of a sudden, they start doing things on their own. And, uh, and there's cool things they're doing. And the other times they're going, what are you up to, kid? What, what are you doing? So here's Jesus in one of those moments at age 12. So in 41, it says they used to go up to Jerusalem every year to the feast of Passover. And when he became 12, verse 42, he went up according to the custom of the feast. And as they were returning and spending, uh, after spending the full number of days, seven days there, uh, the boy stayed behind, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, and his parents were unaware of it. So um, they're traveling back. They've already traveled a day back, and what would that be about three days or something like that? And they probably start asking the siblings, doesn't say it here, but they start to wonder, where's your older brother? Where, where, where's Jesus? We haven't seen him. And they looked among the relatives that we're traveling to. Nobody can find him. So they're desperately searching. And then, so the Bible says it took them two days after they returned and they searched for him and, and they found him in in the temple. So here's what it, how uh, his mother says to him, uh, verse uh, 48. And when they saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, son, why have you treated us this way? Behold, your father and I have been anxiously looking for you. And so here's Jesus. And Jesus said to them, why is it you're looking for me? Did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? Or another translation says, about my father's business. 
And they didn't understand, verse 50, they didn't understand that statement that he had made to them. And then he went down with them to Nazareth and he continued to be in obedience to them and his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And verse, 50, verse 52, Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature in favor with God and man. So we, we got to have a picture, a glimpse of Jesus' life. When he was little, there was that uh, uh, close call for Jesus. His, his life was uh, threatened by Herod. Close call, God pulled, pulled that situation out and said, no, I've, my son has got to finish this plan. And just want to say to you, maybe physically something happened in your life that God spared your life and you're here to tell different. But that day that you realized that God had called you into his kingdom, a whole new world opened up to you. And he said, I'm not finished with you yet. I've got things for you to do. And since then, you've been growing in wisdom and grace. You've been learning how to do this God thing. How do I do this? How do I walk with Jesus? And in, uh, Jesus will say in John 15, I'm the vine, you're the branches. So it's like, let's keep it simple here. I'm the vine, you're the branches. Abide in me and I in you. Um, you can't do anything without me. So then, there's this life that means it's not about just going to church. It's not about just, it's about this life with the Christ spirit that we walk and talk with him all the time that he promised to be with us all the time, to help us through every situation. I've been, I heard from a person this last week who said, you know, since you've been talking about prayer, I found myself praying more. <laughs> that's the coolest thing. That that's, whether you come on Tuesday night or not, it's about talking to God all the time. Just you're in this constant, help me, guide me, help me. What do I do here? How do I, how do I please you? So waking up to this awareness of who you are. So this, this last glimpse that it looked like Jesus was coming to his own, realizing who he was. Don't you know that I'm about my father's business? So I want to say to you, if you're a believer here today, Remember who you are. The decisions you make, whether you're going to school or whether you're work or you're going into retirement, whatever you're doing, it's like, how do, I, how do I honor God in this situation? How do I do this? Right now, we're praying over um, Andy and Garrett. We're just saying, Lord, please let it be your will to save Garrett from, from this and raise him back up that we can serve together again. And so thank you for joining us in, in, in calling out to God for prayer for them. Um, so I have um, a little application that I wonder if you would join with me. Um, there are either grandkids or um, young people in your life somewhere. Maybe this week, you could take it upon yourself to be an encouragement to that kid. Now, you don't have to stop at age 12, but you know what's happening during that time. They're trying to figure out how, to, how does this whole thing work. Maybe this week you could be uh, an encouragement to your grandson or granddaughter. And um, so this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to um, ask their parents. I'm going to call and say, can I talk to Carter or can I talk to Emmett? Now, I've never done this before. I've never talked to him on the phone, but I'm, I'm thinking that's my plan is that I'm going to, for the first time, I'm going to just say, hey, this is Grandpa, and what are you doing? And I know Emmett will just go on like this, so that'll be, that'll be okay. But I want to purpose, and I wonder if you'll join with me in purposing to encourage a young person that's trying to figure out the body that they're in this week. 
and then come back next week and we can talk about maybe how that went. Now, if you don't have any uh, grandkids, um, you know families that do, maybe you could call and encourage mom and dad because you know right where they are. Um, if you as grandparents were grandparents first, then you'd know better how to raise children. You know, So you know that they're in the midst of that and they need encouragement. And so uh, maybe you can think of uh, words of encouragement, not words of, um, what do you call it, um, uh, a hint of what they could do better. Don't do that. Advice. advice. Don't, <laughs> don't be given advice, but just give encouragement for them. Okay? So um, we have the hour before the service. That would be a great place to come back and report in and we'd just rejoice. And, but if not, we'll get some of you to share next week. But would you join me in that and just uh, figure out some of those kids? And so I, I have a feeling I know uh, what... Um, your kids are going to talk about, but so just a tip there. I'm going to call sometime. When is the best time to call? When is school done? <laughs> okay, I have to figure that out. All right. So um, may the Holy Spirit um, in you as we start. We're kind of starting this series called "Growing Up with Jesus." You're little. God saved your life somewhere along the line. You're in that phase right now where you're growing in wisdom and grace. And the more kindness that you show, the, the, the closer you are to Je looking like Jesus, that's the whole thing. And you know that his whole plan for each one of us is to, is to love people into the kingdom and to love people along the way and encourage people along the way that know Jesus. Okay? So, um, so, Remember who you are. Okay, let me just thank the Lord, and, um, and uh, then we'll... Um, Alice is going to play just some songs. as we. And if you want prayer, um, Dale and I are going to be available, and I'm going to just have Dale just stay right over where he's at. Um, Mike, is, he's losing his voice, but he's available. But um, if you would just like to pray, um, just... Talk to one of us, and so it won't be like I'll just stay right here, but if you want to pray together, um, that, that would be awesome. So, Alice, if you want to just start playing some music, I will do a closing prayer as she's start playing, as she's playing. And um, also, just go ahead, Alice. Also, if you don't have one of these, come and see me. It's uh, got all the Bible verses of those pertinent, uh, pertinent places in your life. And let me just see, um, let me just run through some of this here. Um, if uh, you need help forgiving others, here's some Bible verses in here. Uh, fellowship, here's some Bible verses in here. If you need confidence in your life, here's some verses here. If you have physical sickness, here's some verses here that you could um, read and pray. Um, if you need patience, here's some verses here. So if you don't have one, come and see me and we'll make sure you, you have one. I'll just be your, your help. Okay. So um, let's pray. Father, uh, we thank you, Lord God, that um, right now we're sitting here going, since you came into my life, um, you've been trying to get my attention to change some things. And so, Father, I just want to say, keep changing me, Lord. Keep bringing those things into my life. And uh, so I just thank you, Lord God, for each one here. And I, I, I pray that change for each one. And then, Lord God, I, I pray for um, uh, those, maybe there's somebody here that hasn't really uh, put their faith in you. They're still holding out. Maybe they've been coming to church here and they're, they're doing this stuff and, and maybe they haven't. And certainly Jesus' brothers and sisters, they had gone to Jerusalem and they had been doing this stuff, but we find out that they weren't believing until later after Jesus died and rose again. But even his own siblings didn't really believe who he was. And so, Father, I pray for uh, those in this room here that may not know you. Um, 
that, that you would call them, that they would just, they would trust you even today. They would know that as many as uh, received you, um, to those who believe in you, that you've given them the right to become children of God. And uh, Father, that with that, that you have, uh, that you forgive sin. That's the way that you make um, this relationship with you work. Father, I just praise your name. I thank you, Lord, for those in this room that um, are understanding your uh, amazing grace. And, and they are so being filled with your love that it just leaks out of them wherever they go. That's, that's your Holy Spirit. Father God, would you just keep doing that in them, keep doing that in me, keep doing that in us, that we would do well with, the, with these bodies and these minds and these hearts, that we do well with the time that's been given. So we thank you, Lord God. We praise your holy name. Father, one more time here together, we pray for Garrett. We pray a miracle on him that you would raise him back up, that you would heal him and um, strengthen and encourage Andy as she waits, as she waits for Garrett to come home. Lord, we bless your name. You are worthy to be praised. We thank you in Jesus' name, amen.